Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I'm continuing a series that I started a week ago talking about living in the balance of grace and faith. And I tell you, this is just awesome. This is the very first book that I ever wrote. I've expanded it. This is uh, bigger than the first book because I've added some to it. And again, this was written, I couldn't even tell you, but 20 or something years ago. And so the teaching I'm doing right now will add something to this again. But this book, I'm offering this as my free gift to you. It's over a 200-page book. We are asking people to give something to help us with the cost of it. But we want you to have this because this has changed my life, and I know it would change your life. And I also have a uh, study guide that is in a different format. This is the same truths. It's just formatted differently. It'll come up with radical statements. You know, like, do you believe that it's grace that saves you or is it faith? And you just let the people talk and they, there are no right or wrong answers. And then after you get through discussing it, it, you go to these scriptures and read it and the scriptures answer the questions. And it's a way of interacting and discipling people. And then we also have CDs, DVDs, and a USB. And I'd encourage you to please take advantage of those materials. So I've already covered so much. I can't go back through all of this, but uh, this is something that very few people put into balance. They are either grace people or they're faith people, but they very seldom put the two together. Sometimes grace people criticize faith people and talk about how they're just so legalistic and how they're working so hard thinking that God is responding to them when the truth is it's all the grace of God. Or... You'll have faith people criticizing the grace people that they don't believe uh, that they have any control over anything. It's just all up to God. Que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. And they get into an extreme sovereignty to where they don't have to do anything. Both of those are wrong. You need to have a balance. Grace is God's part. Faith is our part. Grace is something that's done independent of us. Faith is not something we do to get God to respond to us. It is our positive response to what God has already done by grace. And if you are doing something trying to get God to respond to you, then it's not true Bible faith. Faith is not something you do to gain a response from God, but it is your positive response to God. It only appropriates what God has already provided by grace. Let me use these verses out of Ephesians. And did you know Ephesians is a great example of this? The first three chapters are talking about what God has already done for us, independent of us. And it's just talking about grace. But then chapters 4, 5, and 6 are talking about how should we respond to God's grace. And it starts talking about how we need to behave ourselves, And it talks about husbands and wives, how they treat each other, parent and child. And so, see, some people would just say, well, it's all the grace of God. Well, then that would mean that you could treat people anyway, and it doesn't matter because God's grace is going to work regardless. That's not true. You can stop the grace of God. You can get more grace is what it says over in 1 Peter chapter 5. God gives more grace. I believe that's maybe James chapter 4. James 4 and 1 Peter chapter 5 both say that God resists the proud but gives grace unto the humble. And it says He'll give more grace. And so you can increase God. You can frustrate the grace of God is what Paul said in Galatians chapter 2 verse 21. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God for if righteousness comes by works, then Christ is dead in vain. So the grace of God is independent of us, but you can frustrate it. You have to cooperate with it. And as it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 2, you have to access the grace of God through faith. So it's not just the grace of God. If it was only the grace of God, every person would be saved. Every person would be healed. Every person would be prosperous. Every person would be walking in total joy and victory because it's already been provided by grace. But we have to respond in faith. And that faith doesn't make God move. It allows God to release what He's already provided for us. So here in Ephesians, like I said, the first three chapters are just amplifying what we already have in Christ. 
He says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you, and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Notice the terminology, He hath blessed us. He's already blessed us. God has already commanded His blessing upon us, and yet there are so many Christians that know that God can bless, favor, prosper you, and they desire it, but they are doing everything they can trying to get God to bless them. They aren't resting in the fact that He's already blessed us. And somebody says, well, what's the difference? Huge difference. To know that something is already done and all you got to do is just discover it, it, it's relatively easy. You know, if, if I told you that you had a million dollars buried in your backyard, if you really believed me, then you'd go and you'd start looking for it. And if you didn't, you know, if you had one of these huge backhoes or if you had a bulldozer or something like that, you might could find it quicker but if all you had was a tablespoon, and if you really believed me that you had it, I guarantee you, you would keep digging until you found that million dollars. But if you just thought, well, I'm not sure that that's true. I'm not sure that I can't see it. It's a lot of effort. It's a lot of work. I guarantee you, most people would just give a token effort, and if they didn't find something easily, then they'd give up. But if you knew beyond any shadow of a doubt that it was there, it's just a matter of time until you find it, you would keep working. And see, this is what happened with me. I knew God just revealed to me that I was already blessed, that God said that if I lay hands on the sick, they would recover, that He had put the same power on the inside of me that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, I wasn't taught those things when I was a kid growing up. A matter of fact, I was taught sensation, cessation, I can't even say it. But anyway, I was taught that all of the miracles ceased with the apostles and that miracles didn't happen today. That's what was instilled in me. But when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I just knew the Holy Spirit began to witness to me. Just like it says in John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. The Holy Spirit witnessed that to me. And even though I had been taught against that, I knew that this was God's will. I knew that somewhere on the inside of me was this supernatural power. Just like Jesus told the disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I spoke in tongues, and I just knew that somewhere inside of me was this supernatural power. Now, I didn't know how to get it out. I didn't understand a lot, but just the fact that I knew it was here, it caused me to start laying hands on everything that moved. Man, I started praying for people, and I didn't see a lot of good results at the first because I didn't understand the Word of God. I didn't understand the laws of faith and how they work, but I just knew I had it. And you know, an old blind squirrel will get a nut every once in a while if he doesn't quit. And I was just determined that somehow or other, I was going to start seeing the supernatural power of God because I believed I had it. And that kept me motivated. If I would have thought that I had to do something, and God, if I'm holy enough, if I'm sincere enough, if I'm zealous enough, then you will move in my behalf, and I'll start seeing miracles. If that would have been my logic, I'd have quit. I'd have given up because I didn't see a lot of success at the beginning. But see, I just knew that I was already blessed. This is what this is saying. I'm already blessed. He hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Now, just because it's in heavenly places, that means it's in the unseen realm. It's in the spiritual realm, not just out there somewhere, but inside of me. When I got born again, I've got a new spirit, and in my spirit, I am identical to Jesus. 
1 John chapter 4, verse 17 says, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. It didn't say, so are we going to be in the next world. So am I in this world. Now, I can't see that looking in a mirror. I can't feel it just searching my emotions and my mental part. But in my spirit, man, I'm identical to Jesus. And I've already got blessings. I've already got power. I've already got anointing. I've already got provision. I've already got healing. So do you if you're born again. See, this is the point I'm trying to get across is that God by grace in your born again spirit, you have everything you're ever going to need. But it doesn't do you any good as far as your physical experience goes until you learn how to draw it out. I've often used this example. It's like a person who's thirsty, maybe even dying of thirst, and they're leaning against a well and they have water, life-giving water, just a few feet from them. But you could die leaning against that well if you don't know how to draw it out. Through grace, God has put on the inside of every born-again person all of the joy, victory, peace, healing, prosperity, everything that you'll ever need. It's already in there in spirit form. But you got to learn how to draw it out. And you do that, it has to pass through your soul, which is your mental and emotional part. You got to renew your mind, begin to start thinking properly. You got to get rid of your fear and doubt that is a blockage, like a, a stoppage to that power flowing through this pipe into your physical body. So you got to renew your mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When you renew your mind, it's like turning a valve and letting this life that already exists in your spirit flow through your mind and emotions and out into your physical body and into your physical realm. But you're already blessed. I tell you, when I started recognizing that I'm already blessed, I'm not trying to get God to bless me. I'm already blessed. I'm just trying to cooperate with God. I'm going to quit speaking what I see and what I feel. And I'm going to quit speaking negative things over myself. I'm going to quit saying that if I wash my car, I know it'll rain. It may not have rained for two months, but man, if I wash my car, I know it'll rain. You know what you're doing? You're speaking that you aren't blessed, that you're cursed, that nothing ever works for you. There's a lot of subtle ways that we express our doubt. I had to change the way I was acting, and that didn't make God bless me. God had already blessed me, but changing the way I spoke and the way I acted and the way I thought allowed what God had already done to begin to start flowing through me. So going back to Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath already blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And then in verse 4, it says, According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. Man, I wished I had time to just go through this phrase by phrase by phrase, but it would take literally nearly forever to do this. But notice, He says, He hath chosen us. People say things like, Man, I found the Lord. You didn't find the Lord. He found you. He wasn't the one that was lost. God has chosen us. He, this may be a little too technical for some people. It may, most people don't want to think very hard, but if you can follow this, God actually has chosen everyone before the foundation of the world through Christ. It is His will, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that no one perish but that all should come to repentance. So he chose to send Christ before the world was ever formed. It says that he was slain from the foundation of the world. So God anticipated that we were going to sin, that we would turn against him. He anticipated that he would send his son and pay for the sins of the entire world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. He didn't just pray for the, pay the price for the people who would accept him. He paid the price for the sins of the entire world. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. But notice, He chose us in Him. God's forgiveness, God's acceptance, everything that He wants to do is for every person, but it's in Christ. 
AND IF A PERSON DOESN'T ACCEPT CHRIST, IF THEY DON'T PUT THEIR FAITH IN CHRIST, THEN THEY DON'T HAVE ACCESS TO THIS GRACE THAT GOD HAS PROVIDED FOR EVERYBODY. AGAIN, I GO BACK TO A VERSE I'VE USED A NUMBER OF TIMES, ROMANS CHAPTER 5, VERSE 2, THAT WE HAVE ACCESS BY FAITH INTO THIS GRACE WHEREIN WE STAND. GOD HAS ACTUALLY CHOSEN EVERYBODY. YOU KNOW, THIS IS SOMETHING I'M MEDITATING ON. I, I'M NOT SURE. I may, MAY BE PREMATURE SHARING THIS, BUT THERE'S TWO OR THREE SCRIPTURES THAT I'VE BEEN LOOKING AT LATELY WHERE IT SAYS THAT IF YOU DON'T CONTINUE THAT GOD WILL BLOT YOUR NAME OUT OF THE BOOK OF LIFE. AND THEN OVER IN THE BOOK OF REVELATIONS, IT TALKS ABOUT THAT THE BOOKS WERE OPENED AND THE BOOK OF LIFE WAS OPENED AND PEOPLE WERE JUDGED OUT OF THE THINGS WRITTEN THEREIN. AND IF YOUR NAME WASN'T FOUND IN THE BOOK OF LIFE, THEN THEY WERE CAST INTO THE LAKE OF FIRE. SO HERE'S WHAT I'M THINKING. I THINK THAT GOD REALLY HAS EVERY PERSON WHO HAS EVER LIVED ON THIS PLANET, HAS THEIR NAME WRITTEN IN THE BOOK OF LIFE, BUT IF YOU DON'T ACCESS WHAT JESUS PROVIDED, HE WILL BLOT YOUR NAME OUT. HE WILL ERASE IT. IT'S NOT THAT WHEN YOU ACCEPT HIM, HE WRITES YOUR NAME THERE. HE WROTE YOUR NAME, AND IF YOU BY GRACE WILL RESPOND, WELL, THEN YOUR NAME IS IN THE BOOK OF LIFE. BUT IF A PERSON DOESN'T ACCEPT JESUS, AND IF THEY'RE GOING TO STAND ON THEIR OWN, GOD WILL BLOT YOUR NAME OUT. HE WILL ERASE THE NAME. THE POINT OF THIS IS THAT GOD WANTS EVERYBODY SAVED. GRACE HAS PROVIDED IT. BUT IF YOU DON'T COOPERATE WITH GOD'S GRACE, HE'LL BLOT IT OUT. HE CHOSE YOU IN HIM BEFORE THE FOUNDATION OF THE WORLD. IT'S NOT LIKE WHEN YOU CAME TO THE LORD AND SAID, OH, GOD, I NEED HELP. HE SAYS, ALL RIGHT, WELL, THEN I'LL DIE AND FORGIVE YOUR SINS. NO, HE DIED AND FORGAVE YOUR SINS BEFORE YOU EVER EXISTED. He, THE PROVISION WAS MADE. YOU WERE CHOSEN IN HIM, BUT, YOU KNOW, THE SCRIPTURE SAYS, MANY ARE CALLED, BUT FEW ARE CHOSEN. GOD CALLS EVERYONE TO HIMSELF. HE WANTS EVERYBODY TO BE BORN AGAIN, BUT HE ONLY CHOOSES THOSE WHO ACCEPT JESUS. IF YOU ACCEPT JESUS, THEN YOU ARE CHOSEN IN HIM BEFORE THE FOUNDATION OF THE WORLD THAT WE SHOULD BE HOLY AND WITHOUT BLAME BEFORE HIM IN LOVE. IN VERSE 5, HAVING PREDESTINATED US. NOTICE IT DIDN'T SAY THAT HE'S GOING TO PREDESTINATE US. HE'S ALREADY PREDESTINATED US UNTO THE ADOPTION OF CHILDREN BY JESUS CHRIST TO HIMSELF ACCORDING TO THE GOOD PLEASURE OF HIS WILL. TO THE PRAISE OF THE GLORY OF HIS GRACE WHEREIN HE HATH MADE US ACCEPTED IN THE BELOVED. NOTICE THE TERMINOLOGY AGAIN. I'M JUST USING THESE VERSES TO POINT OUT THE POINT THAT I'M MAKING THAT GOD BY GRACE HAS ALREADY CHOSEN TO BLESS EVERY ONE OF US, TO SAVE EVERYONE, TO HEAL EVERY SINGLE ONE OF US. BUT GOD'S GRACE DOESN'T MAKE IT AUTOMATICALLY COME TO PASS. WE HAVE A PART TO PLAY. WE HAVE TO BELIEVE AND RECEIVE. IF WE DOUBT, WE DO WITHOUT. YOU ACCESS THIS GRACE BY FAITH. BUT NOTICE IT SAYS THAT TO THE PRAISE OF THE GLORY OF HIS GRACE WHEREIN HE HATH, IT'S ALREADY BEEN DONE, MADE US ACCEPTED IN THE BELOVED. DID YOU KNOW THAT THE PHRASE RIGHT HERE, ACCEPTED IN THE BELOVED, THIS GREEK WORD IS ONLY USED ONE OTHER TIME IN SCRIPTURE, AND THAT'S OVER IN LUKE CHAPTER 1 WHEN THE ANGEL APPEARED UNTO MARY AND SAID, HAIL THOU THAT ART HIGHLY FAVORED, THE LORD IS WITH THEE. DID YOU KNOW THAT THAT PHRASE, HIGHLY FAVORED, IS THE EXACT SAME GREEK WORD THAT WAS TRANSLATED ACCEPTED IN THE BELOVED? IN THE SAME WAY THAT MARY, THE VIRGIN MARY, THE MOTHER OF JESUS, WAS HIGHLY FAVORED, WELL, THEN WE ARE ALSO HIGHLY FAVORED. WE ARE ACCEPTED IN THE BELOVED. AND NOTICE IT SAYS IT IS ALREADY DONE. AGAIN, SEE, MOST PEOPLE THINK THAT I'VE GOT TO LIVE HOLY AND DO THESE THINGS, AND IF I'LL STUDY THE WORD, AND IF I'LL LIVE RIGHT, AND IF I'LL DO ALL OF THESE THINGS, AND OPERATE IN FAITH, AND DO EVERYTHING JUST RIGHT, THEN I'LL BE ACCEPTED WITH GOD. YOU'RE ALREADY ACCEPTED IN CHRIST. IT'S A DONE DEAL. BUT DID YOU KNOW YOU DON'T BENEFIT FROM THAT ACCEPTANCE IF YOU DON'T KNOW IT, AND IF YOU DON'T BELIEVE IT, AND IF YOU DON'T KNOW HOW TO APPROPRIATE IT? SO IT'S NOT GOOD ENOUGH JUST TO SAY THAT GOD BY GRACE HAS ACCEPTED US, YOU'VE GOT TO BELIEVE IT. IF YOU BELIEVE IT IS WHEN WHAT GOD HAS ALREADY ACCOMPLISHED IN THE SPIRIT BEGINS TO START MANIFESTING ITSELF IN THE PHYSICAL REALM. SO SEE, HERE'S THE BALANCE BETWEEN GRACE AND FAITH. GOD BY GRACE HAS ALREADY MADE YOU ACCEPTED. HE ALREADY LOVES YOU JUST AS MUCH AS HE LOVED THE VIRGIN MARY WHEN THE ANGEL SAID THAT YOU ARE HIGHLY FAVORED. 
God loves you and me just as much as he loved Mary. You know, there's a lot of people that will think, well, oh yeah, God certainly loved the Virgin Mary. And then the Catholic Church has even tried to make her somehow or another a saint that she had an immaculate conception and she never was a sinner herself. And yet that doesn't square with what Mary said about herself. When she went and saw Elizabeth and Elizabeth prophesied over her that she was pregnant with the Messiah and it confirmed everything the angel had told her. Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. Mary admitted that she was a sinner and that she needed a Savior. But some people see just put Mary in this category that, oh man, she was accepted. She was beloved. She was highly favored, but they put themselves in another position. This is the exact same Greek word. The only other time it's used in scripture is to apply to you and me that he hath, past tense, already made us accepted in the beloved. You are already accepted. God by grace has done this. Now you, by faith, it's not something you do by faith that causes God to accept you, but rather your faith just reaches out and appropriates this acceptance that was already made through Christ. In verse 7, it says, "...in whom we have redemption." Notice again, I'm just making this point over and over. We already have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. You know, I've got a teaching that goes into a lot more detail on just this one aspect, but I have a teaching entitled Redemption, and in there, there's a series where we are forgiven of all sin, past, present, and even future tense, future tense sin. And this is taken from 1 John 2, 2, where it talks about that uh, He is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, also for the sins of the whole world. But Hebrews 9 says that by one sacrifice, he has already paid for all of our sins, and it goes through Hebrews chapter 10. So this is saying that we already have redemption. Jesus has already dealt with your sins before you even commit those sins. Does that mean that you're free then just to go live in sin? No, you need to stop sinning as much as you can, but when you do sin, you don't need to feel like, oh God, this is a new transgression against you and I've got to go get this sin under the blood and forgiven, and if I don't, you can't fellowship with me. No, God, by grace, has already forgiven all of your sin, past, present, and even future sin, but you need to appropriate that forgiveness and cleanse your conscience, as it says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more will the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse our conscience from dead works so that we can serve the living God? I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel and the programs that we have available. And I want to encourage you that you can get the materials that we've offered. Also, I'd like to encourage you to like our program and subscribe to what we're doing. We have a lot of material and I believe it'll be a real blessing to you. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you.